This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. My guest is Michael Gordon. He's written a book about pseudoscience, and we will talk about it when we return. This is Dan Schneider. Uh, I am speaking with Michael B. Gordon. The subject is pseudoscience, and he has a new book out talking about it. So as I like to usually do, I want to give my guests a few minutes to discuss who they are, what they do, and what uh, their latest work is about. So Michael, welcome. Uh, if you could give a little background to who you are, uh, your interest in pseudoscience and uh, its pros and cons, and what your current book is about. Sure. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, so I am a historian of science, and uh, things like pseudoscience are usually a strange topic for us. Um, I uh, am a professor at Princeton University, and I teach a variety of topics related to the history of science, uh, mostly in the modern period, mostly related to physics, chemistry, nuclear weapons, and things like that. But this particular topic has been kind of grabbing me since I was uh, fairly young, as I would read my way through science books in the library, and I found these other books that were there next to them about UFOs and parapsychology and so on. And I found them very compelling, but I also recognized that my science teachers didn't think those were real topics. Yeah. And as I started studying the history of science, it was also clear that my historians of science mentors didn't think this, also didn't think those were topics worth looking at. So what I'm interested in and what I do in the book, which is called On the Fringe, where science meets pseudoscience, is to try to explore what we can learn, not just about these various doctrines that are often lumped together under the category of pseudoscience, uh, about those doctrines themselves, but what we can learn about how science operates in our society today by looking at these phenomena that are excluded from it and placed on the edge. So I start with the philosophical debate about uh, what have philosophers said are the distinctions that separate off science from pseudoscience or what I usually prefer to call the fringe. Um, mm. uh, I can talk about why I don't want to use the word pseudoscience quite so directly. Um, and then I talk about a bunch of different ways in which we can parse the diversity of doctrines out there. There are hundreds, thousands, depending how you count, many thousands of doctrines that are non-orthodox, heterodox, on the edge, with different degrees of credibility, some having almost zero credibility among professional scientists, some having a little bit. And uh, I have four categories that I break through the, the, break those down into, and they cover a lot of what people tend to think are um, fringe sciences. So I discuss alchemy, astrology, parapsychology, and ESP research, um, some stuff that happened under the Nazis and under the Soviet Union under Stalin, and then things like Bigfoot, UFOs, flat earth theory, etc. And then the last two chapters of the book try to explore what we can learn about how, how these doctrines emerge, because they continually emerge. Despite many attempts to try to eradicate them, they're still around, and new ones emerge all the time. And I, I think that's not an accident. I think that's a product of how our science system and how the practices of scientific inquiry work they necessarily generate many candidates for alternative beliefs, and those sometimes take off. Um, so that's the kind of precy of the book and uh, how I stumbled into it by sort of resuscitating a past interest from a long time ago and trying to apply the same methodologies historians of science use to talk about Einstein and Darwin and so on to this different world. Yeah, before we get into some of the more uh, more subjects and uh, ideas that you touch upon, uh, the difference between your book and a lot of other books that would deal with uh, very similar topics is that a lot of those books have that uh, kind of Charles Berlitz, uh, Eric von Donneken approach in that it's going to be, oh, uh, person so-and-so saw Lake Monster X or hairy cryptid uh, uh, bipedal human being or uh, hairy bipedal thing. Uh, but you, you, it seems to me that uh, you're more interested in, for example, astrology, why it was once considered a science and now isn't a science. Someone like Emmanuel Velikovsky, who 80 or 90 years ago, you could plausibly think that maybe 
Venus did erupt from Jupiter or something. Now we know that's, you know, kind of silly. Um, uh, so do you yourself look uh, and, and, and make a demarcation? We'll talk about your demarcation, uh, your specific use of the term in a moment. But do you make a difference between some of these things that are such obvious bullshit? You know, I mean, it, you know, you're not going to have, I mean, if you had big feet or Sasquatches, you would need a breeding colony of several hundred of these things. You couldn't keep them under wraps and something like astrology. Uh, so the, the, the general, the, there's a, there's sort of, I would say probably two categories of books that dominate discussion of this stuff. The one is the advocates, like people who have, like I'm, I adhere to one of these theories. Let me provide the best case I can for why it's true. Yeah. And then there's another category of debunking books, which are like, here's all the reasons why this thing is wrong. Um, I see my approach as not doing either of those. Um, I have my own personal views about what knowledge is credible and not credible. I'm not so sure that any reader is especially interested in what I, Michael Gordon, happen to think about UFOs. Although I do get emails, since I work on this topic, regularly from people trying to get me to either endorse or denounce one theory or another. That's not what I think my project is. My project is we, we, we live in a world where uh, scientists and the public have divided doctrines into the orthodox and the pseudosciences. Um, they don't agree on where that boundary is, but everybody agrees that some stuff is legitimate knowledge and some stuff is not legitimate knowledge. They don't always agree about what's in each box. Um, and I'm interested in how that division happens and which things get classed in spaces at various times. So astrology in the Renaissance was definitely classed as an area of natural philosophy that was completely legitimate. Um, there were some debates about what to do with it and how far you could go. So uh, everybody, that not everybody thought that you could predict someone's character or future events from the positions of the stars. Many people did. And that's why astrology was so well funded and why it was possible for astronomers to get positions at various courts across Europe as the court astrologer. Towns had their own official astrologer too. It was a, an official position in the municipal government. Um, so some people thought you could do that. Some people said that doesn't seem likely, but everybody basically thought that certain natural phenomena are caused by the heavens. And that's not crazy, right? The tides are caused by the moon. Uh, the seasonal change is caused by the sun, and they just extend that idea and say some this this drought is caused by Mars, or this storm was caused by a conjunction of these planets in that constellation. So the natural uh, aspects of astrology were very broadly accepted. By the 1600s into the 1700s, by the end of the 18th century, um, astrology has dropped out. It's no longer seen as a legitimate form of knowledge, but as something on the fringe. Other doctrines, like um, Velikovsky, for example, almost from the moment he spoke, people were like, that's nonsense, that's out. Uh, many people thought it was appealing, but the establishment thought it was out. And so there's a different character between those doctrines that started out within the establishment and then leave it, and those that emerge from outside, like UFOs, and kind of never crack in. Um, and I think that that's a, that's a distinction worth looking at. And the reason why they have those separate histories has something to do about when they emerged and how they emerged. Mm -hmm. So history can help us differentiate among the, about the life courses of these things, even if it can't necessarily tell us which are true and which aren't true. So before we get to, to going through your book, I just thought it, it occurred to me that, uh, uh, there's always a political or, or financial, uh, backing somehow to a lot of these things. And what I mean is, if you look at someone like Isaac Newton, now Newton is probably up there in the top 10 of most people's list of smartest and most influential human beings of all time. But he was also an alchemist. Uh, and he, yeah. he apparently spent as much time pursuing alchemy, if not more, than he did on his own, you know, his own scientific stuff. And it, I, I was thinking too, recently, um, over the last 40 years or so, people have talked about dark matter and dark energy. And, uh, there have been other uh, theories, for example, modified Newtonian dynamics uh, meant to explain mm -hmm. what we think uh, of there. And that is sometimes pushed on the fringe. Yet, 
it probably is about 50-50 in terms of explaining things with uh, dark energy in terms of uh, and dark matter and uh, and how galaxies rotate and and uh, uh, sort of stuff. Now I'm not an expert, but I, I'm wondering why is something like modified Newtonian dynamics, which seems to be as legitimate a claim as dark energy, uh, why is that considered on the fringe now, whereas dark energy, which has not been proven for, for or dark matter, I should say, for 40 years, uh, not, you know, pushed there? Uh, so to, uh, the first level answer, and it's gonna be my main answer, is that it's a social distinction in that um, the consensus view among establishment scientists is the one that decides what belongs in the middle and what belongs on the fringe. That might sound trivial, like it's just a club of people making arbitrary decisions, and that's not what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, so the reason why dark energy and dark matter are seen as an explanation for the expansion of the universe and MOND, the modified Newtonian dynamics is not, is that is largely because um, dark matter fits into a bunch of other theories quite well, that also explain things. So even though it's not proven, its absence would mean that a whole sector of astrophysical theories need to be rethought and redone. And those theories work quite well. Whereas the Newtonian dynamics one helps explain this one phenomenon, but doesn't necessarily explain the richness of the others. That said, it's, it's perfectly legitimate to work on, on uh, the Newtonian dynamics. It's published in journals, people discuss it. It's just not the mainstream idea. So one way to think about this is there's a there's an orthodox middle zone, and uh, which is stuff like there are atoms, and you know gravity works this way on planet Earth, and water is composed of hydrogen and oxygen, stuff that no one's debating. Then there's stuff that's uh, um, less orthodox, which is where the frontiers of science are, where they're developing new ideas and understanding the acceleration of the expansion of the universe is in that zone. And some of the theories like dark matter are seen as more orthodox. Some like the Newtonian dynamics are seen as less, but they're still candidates. There are other theories that you could imagine like angels are pushing the universe out that are just way out. Mm -hmm. um, and many theories that were once on the edge, string theory was originally a very much an edge idea in the seventies and early eighties. And by the nineties, it's an extremely orthodox idea about how to get gravity and quantum mechanics, that Einstein's general relativity, I should say, and quantum mechanics to work together. So ideas move in and out from the fringe. And if in the end, modified Newtonian dynamics proves to be a much better explanation, you'll start to see a shift in the community where more and more people accept it, fewer people think dark matter is your explanation and science changes. That's a, a fairly normal process, but it could also go the other way where Newtonian dynamics is less and less explanatory and you end up shoving it way out. Um, how that evolves is basically the drama of how science works. And uh, but it's very hard to predict in advance which way one would go. But the answer as to why something is seen as central and why something is seen on the edge is largely what does the community that that is the sort of socially constituted expert, they have reasons for thinking why something is mainstream and something isn't. And uh, stuff ends up moving in that direction. A good example of this is um, continental drift, and then I'll stop for a second. That When that theory was first proposed in the 19 teens, it wasn't completely locked out, but it was basically extremely marginal. And most geologists thought there's no way the continents can move. And the reason they thought that is because the continents are made of softer stuff than the oceans. So if the continents moved into the ocean, they would break apart. So the continents can't move. The, by the 1970s, the theory of continental drift is now um, orthodoxy. And the reason that happened is because people reimagined what the motion would be, which is the spreading of the seafloor is the way they think about it. But there was a theory that is that the, the spacing of the continents have changed dramatically over time and are changing now that was proposed, basically fringed, and then became orthodox all within about 70 years. And that's a pretty fast process. And sometimes it happens that way. And sometimes you go the way of astrology. You start in the middle and then you get kicked out. Yeah, uh, another good example would be uh, the idea of catastrophism versus incrementalism. Yeah. Uh, but now we know it's somewhere in between actually, that yeah. for, for, yeah. for vast eons, things will change very little, 
either geologically or within species, then all of a sudden there might be a sudden shift, you know, a, an asteroid or a comet comes down and boom, you know, from the, uh, uh, what is it, the, the Mesozoic and then you're already in yeah. the Cenozoic. Um, but I, it, that you mentioned string theory. Now, that's another theory, though, that for 40 years, I was just reading an article in, it might have been Scientific American a couple of weeks ago, about uh, uh, how it seems to be a, a theory that physicists are hanging on to because it makes mathematical beauty rather than mm -hmm. actual provable science. And so I wonder if... Uh, to what degree does this idea, and I, I really hate the idea of beauty when it comes to people talk about beauty in the arts, but it's even more galling for me when I talk about science because the world is ugly. The cosmos yeah. can be a damn ugly place. Fuck all this beauty stuff. Stick with what you can prove. Uh, so um, there are many reasons why scientists find a theory compelling, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's uh, empirical adequacy. It ca captures the largest amount of stuff, but the theory is awkward. Um, sometimes it's simplicity. You have the fewest number of postulates to make the certain results. Sometimes some people care about that, some people don't. Einstein cared a great deal about how elegant the theory was, and he had specific standards of what that meant, which is if you had to have a, like three or four unrelated hypotheses to explain a particular physical effect, and you could actually come up with one fairly weird hypothesis that explained it uh, that is mathematically simpler, uh, but requires you to think in four dimensions, you should pick that one. You should pick the one that's more elegant. The world, the universe is an ugly place, but it's not clear that uh, many would say that in the level of physical theory, the equations that govern motion, the Schrodinger equation, uh, Einstein general relativity are quite elegant and compact. And so for them, uh, the elegance of a theory shows that it's uh, more conceptually coherent. And, and that I might be the word that you're looking that you yeah. that you would find better than beauty. I wonder I wonder though how much of that has to do with the human tendency to like clarity uh, and uh, what we call beauty because I could certainly imagine an alien intelligence looking at our mathematical equations and saying, well, of course, that, uh, of course, uh, you know, you're making things up for this or, or the other thing when it's really that, because they have senses, sensory perceptions that we simply don't have. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's just something I've, I've always thought that uh, when I've argued with some people, I'm, I'm one of the camp that uh, mathematics is a language, that it's not, it's not reality, you know, but <clears throat> that, that's a debate for another time. So uh, let's talk about, uh, uh, the demarcation problem, and also uh, the the thing about uh, Popper and falsification, because certainly science, uh, the replication of results is uh, a bedrock of science. So explain those three things, if you will. Uh, the three, the demarcation, demarcation, the falsification, theory, yeah, and and and, and, and replication. replication, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, okay. There's one point I wanted to say about the, the messiness point from earlier, oh, okay, okay. Uh, which is the, the periodic table in the 19th century looked like it was just 70 or so scattered elements that were all very different. And people were very happy with that model. And we now have a vision that they're built up of protons, neutrons, and electrons, which is fewer things that make the diversity. And some people, and the, the vision was that's a cleaner explanation than the other, but you're totally right that it's based on our preferences for what counts as simple. It also happens that atoms are made up of protons and electrons, but, um, but, but there's also a, a pleasingness of it that scientists have come to appreciate. We don't have to agree with that and you could come up with alternative models. Okay, demarcation. Um, the demarcation problem is that the term is coined by Karl Popper, who is an Austrian-born philosopher who ends up in the United Kingdom, um, is the problem of how do you differentiate science from non-science? So there are many different kinds of knowledge out there. Some of them we consider to be sciences, and we think that science has a certain set of properties. It's more reliable. It has, um, it's more objective. There's a whole bunch of characteristics. And then other kinds of knowledge we think are not that. So how do you separate the two? Uh, is it possible to come up with a simple criterion that separates sciences from non-sciences? That's the basic demarcation problem. The, the, the core demarcation problem that most people talk about 
and the one that I address in the book is how do you demarcate sciences that are actual sciences from ones that look a lot like science and seem to be almost science, but are somehow not. And those are the things that people call pseudosciences. They're, they're pretty close. They make claims about nature. They have the same kinds of, uh, they seem to have the same kinds of language and explanation, but one of them is geology and the other one is creationism. Like they, they, are, they are somehow not the same. So uh, people have, so Popper had his own vision of what that criterion should be. What would be the demarcation criterion between sciences and pseudosciences and also sciences and non-sciences. And for Popper, before Popper, the general theory was confirmationism. That is, a science is a science if, or verificationism is also what's sometimes called. A science is a science if you get lots of data, and the more data you get, the more it confirms your theory. Then your theory is verified. So uh, the way you become a science is you explain large amounts of empirical material. The more empirical material you, claim, you can explain, the more scientific you are. Popper thinks that's nonsense. And the reason he thinks it's nonsense is because it's always possible to come up with an explanation for a particular piece of supposedly disconfirming data and make it seem like it confirms your theory. And the examples he uses here are uh, Freudian psychoanalysis, which was definitely a science in the Vienna that Popper was in at that time, and Marxist scientific materialism, a vision of how historical change happened. And he thinks that if you say, you know, oh, look, here's a peasant rebellion, it confirms my theory of historical change. Here is a place where a peasant rebellion was suppressed. That also confirms my theory of historical change. He thinks there's something fishy about that. Many people would agree there's something fishy about that if you can weasel your way out of disconfirming evidence every time. So Popper says the way you can tell a theory is scientific is if it um, makes a claim about what would make it wrong. It's that says, look, I think that when you open this box, the ball inside it is going to be blue, not red. And I, I have a theory of ball transformations that explains why it should be blue at this moment. And you open it up and it's red. My theory is wrong. So I made a spoke up. My theory though was scientific. It was a scientific theory that made a prediction that could have been true or false. And when it's false, I give it up. So the way science works according to Popper is a string of negative results. People pose theories, and then they try to knock them down. And scientists, to be more scientific, should try really hard to knock their, their own theories down. His inspiration here was Einstein, whose um, theory of general relativity predicted that starlight would bend by a certain amount when it passed by the sun, and you could measure that during the solar eclipse. And Einstein had a specific prediction. And according to Popper, Einstein's position was, look, measure it. If, I, if it's wrong, my theory is wrong. That's it. Then we'll, so it's a kind of gambling macho sort of thing where I like, I stake everything on the roll of the dice. Um, Popper really liked that criterion for determining what's a science and what's a pseudoscience. And he said, pseudoscientists can't do this. They can't name a falsifying instance that would prove them wrong. And then when it happened, give up the theory. Um, there's a bunch of problems with this. Do you want me to get into what the problems with the Popper yeah, vision are? It, it, yeah, if you can, briefly within a few minutes. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I, can, I can do this pretty quickly. So, the, there, there are, so this Popper theory is very, very attractive, and it appears now in textbooks and high schools and so on as to how you differentiate science from non-science. Sciences are falsifiable. The problem with this is twofold. The first is it's very hard to tell when you've, in fact, falsified a theory. So suppose they had measured the eclipse results and they didn't get the number Einstein predicted. Does that mean Einstein's wrong or does that mean they did the measurement wrong? As it turns out, they actually kind of did the measurement wrong and they didn't quite get Einstein's result at the time, but they said they confirmed the theory and the theory is confirmed in the next couple of years very precisely. But the, so when you have a disconfirming instance, the fault could be in the experimenter or the experimental apparatus. This is something that everybody who's done middle school or high school science labs experiences, right? Like you, you think you're supposed to measure what the, the molecular weight of water is and you get it wrong. Does that mean the science is wrong or you screwed up? And it's often you screwed up. So Popper's theory isn't quite as clean as he would like it to be. The second problem is that there are lots of things that we consider sciences that don't adhere to the falsifiability criteria. And there are lots of things that most people consider pseudosciences that do. So 
uh, creationists love Popper's criterion because they constantly say, oh, look, Popper is how you determine what's a science. Here is, if you found a fossil that looked like this, we would be wrong. You haven't found that fossil, therefore we're not wrong. Mm -hmm. Or if you found this kind of geological formation, we'd be wrong and you can't find that. And very often people in fact do find those geological formations and uh, the, the creationists say, well, here's our new falsification criterion. We have a different one now. Um, this, um, and then there are other sciences like geology, which uh, are sometimes called historical sciences. Cosmology is one, evolution is one, where you can't run the tape again. So you can't do experimental knowledge the way Popper really liked it because the universe only exists in one way. And so um, cosmologists can't make falsifiable claims about the early universe in the same way that someone working on um, silver bromide reactions in a lab can. So Popper's criterion is actually not a very good fit for all the sciences we have or all the fringe doctrines that are out there. Mm. And I argue in the book that we actually can't find a single uniform criterion because science is too heterogeneous. There's too many different kinds, too many different methods, too many different approaches. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't still talk about what that fringe looks like and has it has certain characteristics. It's just you're not going to find a bright line, 100% true litmus test that will be able to separate. So some things will look weird, like string theory, and then you'll think, okay, that's, that's ridiculous, or maybe it's credible. And then they move one way or the other based on how history unfolds. So uh, you had just mentioned about, um, I guess what we would call maybe the wiggle room that's in science for, for this stuff. Um, what comes immediately to mind uh, is several different types of that. And let me give you three examples. There's the, the wiggle room of where people are invested in something that's obviously false. And I think of the ongoing trial about Theranos, you know, and mm -hmm. the testing of blood. This yeah, yeah, seems yeah, yeah. to me to have been an obvious scam uh, on sciences that any, any scientist should have recognized, but you had powerful people with vested interests uh, in this, et cetera. Uh, the second one that comes to mind is, uh, I think of the redefinition of Pluto as a dwarf planet. And I look at the, the definition and I, I think there were like three categories. It had to be round, clear out its field and, and something else. And yet what is clearing out its orbit really? Because comets and asteroids still hit the, the earth. They still hit all the mm -hmm. other planets. So what is cleared out? Uh, and then the third one is uh, when there's just, just something accidental. And I think of uh, the old science bromide about brontosaurus. Now we know from, I don't know if you, you're aware of it, in, in recent, the last year or two, that there really was a brontosaurus. Brontosaurus originally was thought to have had a camerasaurus skull put on uh, an apatosaurus body and that brontosaurus didn't exist. But it turns out that there are, they have found actual brontosaurus skull that are different than apatosaurus. So we initially had this animal brontosaurus, the, the, the quintessential dinosaur possibly, for 100 years or so, we're told, oh, it really wasn't. It was an apatosaurus. And then, oh, we were wrong. Forget the last century. Yeah. So we have accidental yeah. stuff. We have, have definitional stuff. And then we have outright fraud. If you want to talk on either of those three. Sure. Um, so th there are a bunch of... One of the reasons why um, I think people get frustrated ab about the way establishment science, which I'm doing in air quotes here, yeah. works, um, and uh, are attracted to the fringe is they have a particular conception of how science works that's not accurate, which is they sort of believe the stuff they were told in middle school must be permanent knowledge, yeah. like that, they, that, that science uh, has made a verdict and that's right and we're done. And so things like dinosaurs are scaly. Well, dinosaurs, many of them had feathers, we now know, uh, or we now believe with a lot of evidence. But that when you show those those reconstructions to people, they're like, that's not a dinosaur. No way. Uh, because I know what they look like because I remember Jurassic Park and other things that I was taught when I was a kid. Likewise, Pluto being a planet, there was a particular definition of what a planet was. Pluto was one. They modified the definition in part because if you included Pluto, there were other things you would have to include. And so you'd have them with more planets. And if you change the definition of Pluto, it would be more consistent with how we label things like Ceres 
and other large asteroids. Um, and the definitions aren't perfect because science changes over time. And there are reasons why people argue for one set of definitions over another. That's all a very normal scientific process. That's how science tends to operate. But it sometimes produces results like the Brontosaurus one you mentioned, which are surprising and look like people are making stuff up. Right? Yeah. Like they, it looks like people are just changing their minds for no reason. So in, in the cases of the Pluto and, and the Brontosaurus, I think um, the way to show people that this is actually not anomalous or ridiculous is um, a greater amount of knowledge of how science operates, like, like how the details work and what the justifications were for why you want to work planet, not planet. The case of Theranos is a different phenomenon. There's a couple of phenomena that often get lumped in with fringe science and have some characteristics that are similar that are a little different. Um, there's fraud. There are hoaxes, which are like fraud. And some fraud is deliberate, and some fraud is kind of inadvertent and then becomes more deliberate. And then there's stuff um, where there is, it's often called denialism where uh, certain industries sponsor things that look like scientific research that are designed to slow down regulation, whether of uh, ozone depleting chemicals or fossil fuels or the classic case, to cigarette smoke, tobacco smoke being bad for you. The tobacco industry paid for a lot of research, much of it which, which was done in a lab, perfectly normal, but the purpose of those experiments was to argue that the science isn't settled we need to keep doing research you can't regulate yet. That's not quite the same thing as somebody believing in the bumps on a skull determining your personality. Like they're, they're, they're somewhat different phenomena, but they all get lumped. They, they all travel together because they are all alternative visions of the scientific orthodoxy. And I think that sometimes makes sense to differentiate them a bit. Does that answer yeah. your questions? I feel like I sort of and sort of not answer them. But. Well, I mean, a good example is, uh, well, two good examples would be uh, a global warming and COVID. I mean, uh, you have you have now massive reams of evidence that uh, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, human beings have been speeding up the warming of the atmosphere. But you'll have these people who will deny it. They'll pick on one little thing. Like there was, a, I think it was in Omni magazine 40 years ago, there was one uh, article that said, are we going into an ice age? It was debunked at the time, but they'll stick to that. Or in the case of COVID, oh, my grandma had was doubly vaccined uh, for COVID and she still died. The vaccine is worthless, even though, yeah. even though tens of thousands or millions of people are now probably alive because of it. So you get, you get people who will look at the one little bit of outlier information, true or not, and use that to, to falsify Reams, you know, the the missing link is another one. Yeah, yeah, that's actually like so. There's there's two things there. One is this kind of uh, a tendency to rely on anecdotal evidence, which is, and uh, that often comes from people having um, lack of experience of, and also lack of understanding of how to think probabilistically or statistically about large amounts of evidence. Like, whenever there's like a very cold and snowy winter has happened in the Northeast of the United States last year, you'll have people being like, huh, global warming, that's not happening. Yeah. Look at all this snow. Um, even though one of the predictions of climate change is that you would have more snow because the average temperatures are warmer and so there's more precipitation in the air. Yeah. But like, and, so and, 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 and heat also, it, it's, it, it makes things go up and down more. It, it's more yeah. volatile. Yeah, and that, or that we're not in equilibrium anymore. Yeah. Exactly, like this. So, um, so that, that there's the one kind of reasoning that goes that way. The thing about the uh, Ice Age point is uh, intriguing. It's, it's a lot like the um, auti vaccines cause, the MMR vaccine yeah. causes autism argument, yeah. where there is an article that was published in a leading medical journal that was then uh, debunked and retracted. So the Lancet said most of the co-authors renounced the piece and said it's not true we didn't realize this evidence was fabricated or exaggerated and they, they 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 said we're not part of it anymore and the journal said this is debunked it's not correct they retracted it nonetheless the original article gets cited a great deal by the anti-vax movement this is back when anti-vax meant opposed to childhood vaccination for measles not just yeah. anti-vaccination of all kinds the jenny mccarthy COVID. stuff yeah the jenny mccarthy stuff from back then 
So, so, so there are ways in which old scientific claims, because it was originally a scientific claim, get fossilized in the literature, even as the literature moves on, and people still hearken back to them. Astrology was one of these, and so there are still people who do astrology. It's newly popular again, and they go back to older doctrines that have been uh, reputed, dismissed, or debunked by the main establishment, but because they were once part of the establishment, they still have credibility, and you can gather around it as a knowledge claim, mm. and that happens a lot too. Um, because because people think science is permanent, they don't understand that it often goes the brontosaurus way. Yeah. You end up rejecting something, or re-rejecting it, mm. or undoing the rejection. That's just the dynamism of how it works. Yeah. But it doesn't suit our expectations of what reliable knowledge should be. Mm. So uh, one of the things that I found interesting is uh, uh, in the middle of the book here, you, you talk about both the Nazi and Soviet regimes, and uh, mm -hmm. both of these are very uh, uh, inhumane, uh, genocidal regimes of the last hun hundred years. And yet both of them seem to have a predilection for what we would call pseudoscience. Uh, the Nazis certainly are more famous for it, but the Soviets with this uh, psi experiments are trying to astrally project these kinds of things in, in terms of uh, uh, espionage. Um, if, you want to, if you would talk, what was it about both of those nations or regimes that predispose them to the pseudoscientific bent? I actually, I'm going to push back against the framing of the question because I don't think that's quite right. Okay. Um, there were um, definitely movements that we universally agree are pseudoscientific in the, both of those regimes. But for example, the astral projection uh, espionage through ESP research, the CIA also funded. The yeah. U.S. also did that. Like, So there's nothing specifically Soviet about it. There's something... Uh, Cold War about that. Yeah, but I, uh, I, I, I've heard the term that there, there was there was an ESP gap, just like there was a missile gap, yeah, supposedly. Yeah, right. But but it's it's not clear where that started. Like, mm. did it start that the Soviets did it first, and then the Americans were like, oh my god, we have to catch up, or vice versa? Because yeah. that also happened in lots of cases. Um, there there have been there's ESP research has happened in a Russian and then Soviet universities, and in a, American and British universities throughout. That said. There are, in certain political regimes, um, a push to get uh, some science that fits with the ideology of the regime. What I find interest, one of the things I find interesting about both the Nazi and the Soviet regime is while they had those, so there's an attempt in uh, the 30s in Germany to create a physics that is cleaned of all the Einsteinian components. So no relativity, no quantum theory. No Jewish there, physics. No Jewish yeah, physics. I was saying they call it Jewish physics you mentioned in the book. Yeah, Jewish physics. You want to get rid of Jewish physics and you want to have this German physics. Right. The thing, one of the things that's interesting about that movement is while it starts, it fails. And it fails because the Nazi regime says, we actually really want planes that fly <laughs> and, and, and guns that work. So, so we're going to listen to the people like Heisenberg who tell us that you're wrong and not go back to Newtonian mechanics, um, purely Newtonian mechanics. Um, in the Soviet Union, there's a version of this for genetics where, um, gen it, regarding mostly plants, that uh, Mendel's laws of genetics were seen as pseudoscientific, and instead they relied on a kind of inheritance of acquired characteristics, a Lamarck kind of vision. Yeah. Um, that lasts, uh, uh, it's a struggle up until 1948. From 48 to 65, uh, working on classical genetics is illegal in the Soviet Union. That said, both Nazi Germany and uh, the Soviet Union produced tons of good science too. Um, the jet engine and the rocket both come from Nazi Germany. They also um, develop the first studies into the B dance language. They do tons of work on cancer genesis. Like there's just a lot of nor ordinary science that we still use today that's produced under that regime. The regime was pretty science friendly. It paid a lot of money to scientists. It also paid a lot of money to eugenicists and people who executed huge numbers of people in the name of biology. The Soviet Union also put a lot of money into really weird stuff, and then also one of the most impressive mathematical and astrophysical establishments the world has seen. Like, very good physics came out of the Soviet Union, um, and a lot of very good other sciences, geology, ecology, comes out of the Soviet Union too. So it's not strictly oppressive regimes produce bad science, but it is the case that oppressive regimes that have extremely uh, precise ideologies 
can be friendly or incubate uh, certain ideas that look that, that seem to confirm through through science the ideology of the regime. That they, they don't tend to last for very long, but they do emerge because the political context gives them the space to emerge. And that that ha the, 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 one of the things about the Soviet case is this works in genetics. Like they get that that ideological doctrine for about 17 years, but people try to do it in chemistry and they try to do it in linguistics. They try to do it in a bunch of fields. It fails in every other field. It just worked in genetics. It's kind of strange that um, you would think the pattern once established would, would snowball, but it, but it didn't. Yeah. So I want to talk about something that you don't really di directly mention in the book, but it's something that I extrapolate from. And uh, I myself am a, am a writer and I'm interested in mythos and folklore. And I want to give you two examples and then go to an example from your book. Uh, um, re you know, in the last 10, 15 years, there was an online, uh, I guess they call it creepypasta called Slender Man. I don't know if you're familiar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I've, so you, seen, I've seen right. bits of it. So, so you know the Slender Man thing only started 12, 15 years or so ago. It has a, a, a specific author, a specific mythos. And then afterward, oddly, people then were starting to claim that they would see Slender Man in, in reality. Case number two, Paul Bunyan. Paul Bunyan is an example of a faux mythology because a lot of people don't realize Paul Bunyan was started by, I believe it was uh, uh, one of the logging companies to give mythos to. It, there wasn't, in, in other words, there wasn't a Paul Bunyan mythos that started from the 1600s or 1700s, but it, it, it had a specific start date sometime in the late 19th century. And so I was, when I look, uh, I think it's page 51, you're talking about uh, uh, the Yeti and Sir Edmund Hillary and all the mythos of that. And then you said it sort of shifted uh, over to uh, uh, the North American continent and Bigfoot, Bigfoot being the American equivalent of the abominable snowman or Yeti. And I've always wondered, and especially since I'm sure you're familiar with the Patterson-Gimlin footage, and I'm not mm -hmm. going to argue whether it's yeah. real or not. I don't think it's real. But uh, it seems to me very convenient that uh, after, after all of that stuff over in Asia with the abominable snowman, well, we had to have our own guy. And then we get this idea, uh, well, you know, the Native Americans always talked about a wild man here or there. But, I mean, that goes back to the Bible, Grendel, uh, mm -hmm. Ankadu from Gilgamesh, these hairy wild men. Uh, do you look at the Bigfoot, and I'm just talking the North American Bigfoot, whether we call it skunk ape, Sasquatch, Bigfoot, whatever, as a created bit of pseudoscience that was created for a specific reason culturally? Uh, so th there's, there's a nice book called Bigfoot by a guy named Joshua Blue Booze, B-U-H-F, um, uh, which looks at first, and I, I derive a lot of my accounts from him. He's done a very detailed study. Um, the, the argument he pointed, he's like me, he's not actually interested in saying, is it real or is it not real? But he does say it does emerge in the US at a particular point in time. It emerges specifically in rural areas. Um, and there are reasons for that. Right, like hunters are more likely to be out there in the middle of nowhere and see what's going on, but it also makes it much harder to confirm. And while there are people who definitely uh, present as sincere believers that they have seen something, there's also clear evidence of people who made molds of big footprints and put them in the ground in order to do something, drive notoriety just because it was fun, for Loch Ness, there's a clear um, tourist booster thing that happens around the monster, yeah. which first, you first start to get sightings of the Loch Ness monster around the 1920s. Yeah. And one argument for that is, oh, it's tourism. The, the Loch Ness believers would say, well, that's when you get a road built that cuts down a lot of the trees so you can see more of the water. And therefore, you're more likely to see Nessie yeah. in this context. Um, but there, the, the cryptozoology stuff, the, the like sort of secret animal that has been hidden, they often have this kind of convenient origin point, yeah. and uh, which makes you skeptical of those. But but on the other hand, the coelacanth, which was seen to be extinct yeah. as an ancient fish, was then discovered. Like 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 we, we we thought it was gone, and then we found it, and the giant squid was for ages thought to be mythological yeah. until we found one, right? So 
uh, all it takes is one real sighting right. with uh, with confirmed evidence to prove one of those things is true. Whereas for things like parapsychology, it's a lot harder. To, yeah, but it should it. be noted that both the coelacanth and the giant squid, there weren't, there wasn't an industry, a cottage industry made about yeah. you know, the coelacanth. Oh my god! You know. Yeah. Yeah. There was though a big mythos around the Kraken. Like, like there is a there yeah, is a okay. thing about the giant squid, but it wasn't an industry and there wasn't profiting off it, which there is for Bigfoot and for Loch Ness. Yeah, and I was also thinking of crop circles uh, and how yeah. easy they are to make uh, and what. But uh, that also brings into mind, and uh, it's been a few weeks since I read. It. I don't think you. I think you barely touch upon like the alien stuff. But it's interesting because if you look at the the UFO phenomenon, and let's just talk about the modern cases, not you know, these things they, yeah. oh, it's on some Egyptian tableau. It must be, a, a, you know, yeah. <laughs> it must but be. Mostly a, it's like post 47. Yeah, yeah. The, so you have the Kenneth Arnold side, and then you have the Roswell thing, and then you have all these guys who are su supposed abductees. You know, I went to Venus and I saw these Nordic looking beautiful. And what you did have in the 1950s, it seems, at least in American ufology, if we want to give it a term, uh, was a whole plenum, a, a zoo of different kinds of aliens. Then came the Benny, Betty and Barney Hill case, and, and which was apparently, I, I've read many things, influenced by an episode of The Outer Limits, a show very much like The Twilight Zone back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. They come along and... Everything is sort of these gray aliens afterwards with the bug eyes, you know. Uh, and if you if you saw, you know, some creepy green alien coming out of a, a UFO, you were a crack, a crackpot. But if you saw these gray aliens, you were traumatized and you were like Whitley Strieber. You'd get on Phil Donahue's show or, or something like that. Uh, there seems to be that uh, there is not only the initial birth date of 1947 for the modern phenomenon, but it seems to be that for some reason the hills... And their, their claim tapped into this zeitgeist that was just ready to flower. Um, what is your take on that? Is that similar to the, the, the Bigfoot and Nessie stuff? Actually, I think it's a similar phenomenon. of uh, One of the chapters of the book uh, follows what I call counter-establishment sciences, which are sciences, the doctrines that the establishment will call pseudoscience, but they look... Um, in many ways, they say, well, look, we're, we're actual scientists. One of the basic things is all the people who believe this stuff, no one, except for the fraudsters, um, most people who believe these doctrines are sincere about it. They actually think they saw aliens. They're not making this stuff up. Um, uh, and they believe that that's a real knowledge claim. They don't think it's just a lark. Um, so they do what they see scientists doing. They form societies, they create conferences, they publish newsletters and journals. They do all the things that scientists do. They just do it in a different community that's kind of parallel. Truly and, pseudo, truly, truly pseudo by definition almost. Yeah, 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 yeah no, in that sense, yes. It's, like, it's a mimicry yeah. process. Uh, but this is also what like new scientific fields do when they emerge. They're like, okay, we're a kind of weird sort of experimental field. How do we make ourselves uh, credible. We need to create a society and we need to like train people and we need to have uh, doctrines. So they're doing the same thing that fringy fields that move into the center do. It's just that they, they do it and they don't move into the center. So you end up having ufology conferences and journals. So this gets to your point. It's sort of like at the very beginning of a field, you kind of have chaos. And then uh, as basic postulates and principles get established, you start to get a norm of what counts as a legitimate phenomenon and what is not. So initially, in the sort of late 19th century, um, once in the post-Darwinian age, you start to get the emergence of a new kind of creationism. Theories of creationism were standard, and in fact, the establishment in the 18th century and earlier. Um, but it, there's many different kinds. There are the kinds who think that it's 6,000 years old and it was created in six days. There are the kinds who think it took many years and the days in the Bible are metaphorical. Um, there are people who think that um, God guided evolution. But by the 1930s and 40s, it compresses. And uh, really, in the 50s, it solidifies as a particular reading of creationism. Six literal days, 6,000 years ago. And that all the geological evidence for deep time that you see on Earth is caused by the flood. So the UFO thing is like that. It starts out with a chaos of ideas. And then as it starts to establish itself and build structures and communicative lines and uh, orthodoxies, 
it, it solidifies into these are the legitimate UFO phenomena and these are the fakers. Um, so that, that's a phenomenon that happens in uh, the, the quote unquote legitimate sciences too. Uh, but it, it, you can see it quite strongly in some of these fields that once they get organized, they narrow down what counts as a legitimate knowledge claim in the field to a quite narrow set as a way of building legitimacy and hopefully credibility to get the establishment to pay attention to them. I do want to speak about uh, the idea of denialism. I'll give you a perfect example of someone listening to the show because um, uh, uh, denialism, we have... 30 years ago, we had AIDS denialism, COVID denialism, now anti-vax, uh, global warming we've discussed. But flat earth, you mentioned uh, flat earth uh, here. And it's interesting because earlier, earlier, uh, first five or 10 minutes, you had mentioned that seasons were caused by the sun. Well, it's not it's caused by the axial tilt of the earth uh, going around the sun. You know, if the earth was straight yeah. up, there wouldn't be any seasons. Now, here's what a denialist would say. He'd say, aha, this Gordon just let it slip. He made he made a, 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 an error in in you know a, just a slip of the tongue. He's hiding something, and that seems yeah. to be the the kind of thing that that they say. Ah, and and we we'd have that little five tech second clip of you saying that was caused by the sun. Just just yeah. you know, uh, and and aha, uh, you know, and and that's that kind of aha gotcha thing that these denialists seem to thrive on. Yeah, well, it, 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 the mechanism there, and this is related to another. Uh, characteristically American cultural form, although it exists in other places, the conspiracy theory, as it has evolved largely in the Cold War, in part because they were actual conspiracies, um, uh, it, it thrives on these uh, clips, slips, arguments about cover-up, and for m many of these fringe sciences, not all of them, the cover-up is a large part of their claim. Yeah. So the flat earthers a large part of their claim is NASA is covering up a flat earth. Yeah. And then you need to have an argument about why they would want to yeah. cover up a flat earth. Um, but, the, but in UFOs, the, the ufology case is actually kind of interesting because there actually kind of was a conspiracy to cover up UFO claims, right? Like the Air Force tried really hard to... Project Blue uh, Book? Yeah, they tried very hard to like dismiss these, in part because some of these sightings were probably secret aircraft that they were testing and they didn't want that out. But once there's evidence of a conspiracy, all of these techniques that are associated with the JFK assassination uh, groups, et cetera, come into play and are available for these fringe communities to work with as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can just point to the things like Watergate uh, or, or uh, the Iran-Contra affair. You know, they say, well, if they can cover up this, well, it would be rather easy yeah. to cover up one downed UFO for the seven years. I uh, did a show a couple of months ago with a fellow, I was, and I said, though, it doesn't make sense, though, because if we had 70 plus years to deconstruct uh, and reverse engineer this stuff, we would be dominating uh, the world. And his, his reply was, well, all the nations have it, but it only we only have a, a UFO crash supposedly here in the U.S. and a few other places. And you, you get these these building up that when you, you try to point out something that seems reasonable that, well, if the U.S. had technology of a civilization that could travel faster than light and get here, why wouldn't we use it? I mean, we, we don't have that now, and we, we have a hegemony on, on the world. Right. Why wouldn't we use it? So, so the, 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 the frustration you're pointing to of like, every time I try to point a hole in the theory, yeah. you patch it up and say something else, and then I point out another one, that's part of the reason Popper's falsificationism is so appealing, yeah. because it says like, aha, this is the problem with you people is your reasoning this way and this is a flaw yeah. and popper does point to that and, and it is it's quite um it's quite compelling you're like yes i've met people like that and it is frustrating and falsifiability would solve that particular problem with them mm -hmm. but it doesn't solve other problems but it is it, it does it, the move you're pointing to is quite common i've actually seen scientists do it too it's like it's not it, it, it's it's a it's not like Oops. being resistant in the face of criticism is not an exclusive property of people who are on the unorthodox fringe. It's also something that people who are in the establishment also do. Um, but it is very characteristic and it, 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 it makes it frustrating to have a conversation and feel like you're having any progress. And so the debunking impulse uh, is drawn to certain explanations of this group that I don't think necessarily work coherently, but they also don't help. Yeah. 
Now, uh, I want to talk about one other major thing in your book, and then we'll wrap up. Um, uh, and that is a, a, the subject of eugenics. And this often comes up, and uh, you can't even bring it up in anything other than a negative light because of the history. But I, I give you an example. I've talked over uh, maybe three or four show, shows in this uh, series that I'm doing, uh, the, these interviews. Uh, I knew this family of dwarves when I was a kid. A grandmother, husband, wife, and two sons. And I don't know if you're familiar with it, but dwarves have very painful lives. In, in order to grow properly, doctors have to break their bones so that they, they, their, their bones can grow and that they're not, they don't have severe problems. And I've always argued that if someone came up with uh, some kind of treatment or, or whatnot, genetic treatment, that could alleviate, if not eliminate, dwarfism uh, in utero, we should do that. Now, people are like, oh, but that's eugenics, that's eugenics. But then you'd say, but if this couple, the, the, the husband and wife couple, if they could know that they could have children that they wouldn't pass on their dwarfism to, and they could afford it, or it, it, we had health care as we should in this country, why shouldn't they have that option? Just because the Nazis and, and assholes in the U.S. did all this bad stuff. It's, eugenics isn't necessarily the problem. It's the application of certain eugenics. Don't you think? Well, so, so, so this is, uh, it's, it's, it's a huge minefield, and it's a minefield for a couple of uh, important reasons. It's, it's what, to a certain extent, what you're describing happens now, in that certain people, they, they say they do the amniocentesis, and they see that the child, say, has Down syndrome, and they can decide, do we want to raise a Down syndrome child, or do we not want to do that, and do we want to have an abortion instead? That, um, I'm not, ad I, just so listeners know, I'm not advocating doing that abortion. I'm not advocating not doing the abortion. I'm just saying this debate has happened in multiple forms. If it's something that's the choice of individual people, it's not illegal now, and people do it. The question is, what do you enshrine as policy? And that's a political question. The notion that some things are heritable, and there are some diseases that are heritable, whether we consider dwarfism a disease, one can have an argument, but certain things like cystic fibrosis, those are genetic diseases um, that are considered diseases. They're, they're, there's something you can't process chlor chlorine the right way. Um, those things are heritable. Whether we should try to use incentives or breeding to get rid of those diseases is a political discussion. And that political discussion is not a scientific discussion. It's one about what is a society value, what are its uh, in, what, 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 what would be just, who gets to say, all of those things are very important. Um, part of the problem of having that political conversation is at times we've been quite wrong about what things are heritable and what things are not heritable. Uh, so lots of uh, early eugenicist diseases they wanted to get rid of aren't real. They thought they were real. They, they, either the disease isn't real at all, or um, it's not actually genetic in the way that could be bred out. Um, if something is a, a negative, a recessive um, gene in a certain population, you could, it's a single factor gene, you could maybe get rid of it. But what if it's not that? What if it's multiple forms? What would be the consequences of creating a table of these diseases we're going to encourage or compel people to terminate those pregnancies? So that's a, a rather significant political decision that based on the history of the United States and many other countries with how they deal with minorities, I'm not sure I would trust those countries to make fair decisions about how that would work. But that's a political judgment. It's not actually an epistemological yeah. assessment. And it's the difference. You said you would be in favor of the private, the private parties making that decision. <laughs> What I'm in favor of, I actually don't have children, so I'm not in a position to uh, evaluate what the value of having a child with this condition, would it be worth it for the child or for you if a child had certain conditions that made their lives more of a struggle? I actually don't know what I would do in those circumstances, but it, as a matter of law, people can, in states where abortion is legal now, do this. Okay. So um, and so they, some do and some don't. So let's uh, look ahead uh, to 2100, eight decades from now. If you were a betting man, because you and I probably are not going to be here in eight years, uh, if you were a betting man, what thing that you think is now enshrined as a science or a scientific theory 
do you think will be thought of or seen as bunkum uh, in 80 years? And the reverse, what, if anything, now that you think is a fringe science might make it to be a science? Very, very hard to make predictions. So whatever I tell you is going okay. to be certainly wrong. So <laughs> whatever anybody who wants to bet should bet on the opposite of what I might say. Um, I actually, I think that uh, the, the standard, this is, not a, this is not a very daring bet. The standard model of particle physics, which is how we understand how um, particles work now, uh, the, in, the, in particle accelerators, the Higgs was the last element of the standard model. The standard model is almost certainly not correct. Yeah. It's not the final version of what we need. Um, and that's, there's evidence internal to the theory for that, but there's also the fact that it's, only, it's the tiny portion of matter that is not dark matter. So if dark matter is real, this theory totally doesn't work, but also it, there are predictions it makes that we're now getting close to showing are not quite right. Um, and I think we're gonna have a different theory of how subatomic matter is organized. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be the one I think. So I don't think it's gonna be considered bunk. I just think it's gonna be um, outdated mm -hmm. and uh, we're gonna come up with something different. So I, in many areas of physics, there are theories that we that were created in the 60s and 70s that have been pretty good and have gotten us pretty far and we're now hitting their limits. Um, what is a thing that I think is totally out there and might become orthodoxy? Um, that is that is much harder for me to come up with. I would my guess is it would be something having to do with the brain um, that. Uh, and I don't know enough about the weird theories of cognition that are out mm -hmm. there to say, here are some that look plausible, but that would be my guess of, and that's um, the study of neuroscience is a field that is relatively young yeah. and now confronted with a huge capacity of new instruments and approaches. And it's so complicated and we understand so little of it that it, there's a lot of proliferation of uh, unorthodox theories or edgy theories around it. And that one of those might pay off seems to me not a terrible bet. Yeah, I was just looking this morning about the, the history of engrams, uh, the, the way that memory is stored and, and recalled. Yeah. And uh, that's been in and out, in and out of fashion uh, over how many decades it's been around. Uh, finally, um, so what, uh, if anything, are you going to be working on on your next book? Will it be a continuation of this or will it be something different? Uh, something different. I usually, I, I've written earlier things on fringe sciences, but I, I, I usually take a break and try something different. I'm now working on a project about what happens to the, the structure of science globally when the Soviet Union collapses. Um, when the, one of the largest scientific communities in the world loses its funding, loses its political structure. Um, and what does that do, not just in the former Soviet Union, but in Eastern Europe, the other socialist countries, and then the other countries which have uh, political, economic, and scientific engagements with them, such as Germany, Israel, the United States. So it's a kind of global history of the collapse of the Soviet Union from the point of view of science and scientists. And was it sort of like the Nazis there were, where there was a diaspora of former Soviet sciences? There, there is a diaspora. It, 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 it's, it's actually pretty, it's a lot of people because the community was really large, but it's a smaller set than you would think. Mm -hmm. Most people, the science contracts very rapidly, but most of them don't leave. Most of them go into the private sector and just work uh, in non-scientific fields. But there is a diaspora that's quite significant in Germany, Israel, and the United States, which is interesting in certain fields quite transformative. Well, michaelgordon.com is your website. I'll link to it below this video. People can look you up, contact you there if they want. Thank you for spending an hour or so speaking with me. Uh, thank you very much for having me.